I've got a, a lobbyist who's leaving a major law firm um, and is going out on his own and he's taking two employees with him and a bunch of clients and we're working out the separation but the harder part is working out what we're going to pay these people and their expectations based on what he's promised them before we even started the drafting phase <laughs> and what usually happens is these guys promise the moon you're my partner you're going to be a co-founder with me and the guy is the one generating all the business and the employee who's extremely bright and capable of assisting and servicing the clients hasn't brought in a dime of business in 10 years of working for this guy so we're going to give her a big stake in the business and give her management say so i'm in negotiations with her lawyer who is a very well-known lawyer i don't know how she got to him out of new york and we're trying to figure out a way to to work this out but figure out your structure as best you can for what you're going to do under your business plan benefits benefits you know include health welfare dental vision 401ks things like that what are your competitors doing in the marketplace do you need to beat them to attract the employees or keep the employees so different employers use different tactics and they one of the tactics they use is to poll their employees and really figure out what's important to them they can even customize and tailor benefits based on what the employee population looks like the age as well as the uh, uh, ability to receive coverage outside which allows them to give them additional benefits that might not otherwise be provided like health care but because of the health care reform act we have a lot of constraints on businesses. It still is in effect. It hasn't been repealed. I don't care what Trump says. It's probably going to be with us for quite a while. And so businesses still have to comply with it. You need a benefits expert to help you navigate that. Long-term incentive comp. So here's my spiel on long-term incentive comp. <coughs> this may take a few minutes. <clears throat> Back in 2000, 1999, everybody was getting stock options. Remember UUNet? I used to work with some of those people. Um, or warrants. Warrants. Um, AOL. I represented a bunch of the AOL people. They all got stock options, and the market, you know, from 1995 to 2000 was doing this. It was great. Stock options were the way to go, and everybody got them. Broad-based stock option plans. A stock option is a right to acquire equity. It's a right to purchase stock in that company. And if there is a liquidity event, a sale or a merger or acquisition or an IPO, which was happening a lot back then, then your stock becomes really valuable. The problem with stock options in 2000 and 2001 when the tech bubble burst was that people were being given incentive stock options which is not taxable for regular income tax purposes, but when you exercise one of those options, it is taxable for alternative minimum tax purposes. And usually, the devil's in the details, but people get screwed under those circumstances. Sun Microsystems, I represented one of their executives who exercised uh, incentive stock options at a point right before the tech bubble burst and Sun's stock plummeted at the, at the point of the tech bubble bursting, as did many other companies. Cisco, companies like Net2000, um, some of the other companies locally, I, you know, represented a lot of those people. And they got audited by the IRS. They had exercised their options, but they were incentive stock options, so they thought they don't have to pay any tax. Well, they had to pay alternative minimum tax. Well, when it came time to try to liquidate the option, because it was a publicly traded company, they could sell it. The stock was worth this. Their exercise price was up here, and they had alternative minimum taxable income. And the IRS showed no mercy for any of these. Some of these people went bankrupt as a result of the tax liability. So stock options, I think, are fraught with danger for that purpose. But also the other reason that I try to steer my clients away from stock options is because if you acquire an option, you are acquiring a security in a company which gives you certain rights. Now, it doesn't give you rights as a stockholder. But the minute you exercise your options, 
you do become a stockholder subject to any shareholders agreement that has been drafted. Well, a lot of these companies don't really pay attention to the shareholders agreements and they have optionees who exercise their options and they acquire the stock or they give stock out in the form of restricted stock or stock just ownership to their employees without really thinking about the ramifications of the downside. And from 2000 till about 2010, I was involved in major disputes between my clients who were the companies or the major majority shareholders and these min minority shareholders who had exercised options or gotten stock in the company at an early stage without the company wanting to spend the money or the time to create real restrictions on the stockholders ownership even if it's non-voting stock a stockholder has the right under almost every statute in the united states to examine or inspect the books and records of the company so unless you're willing to open your kimono and show your company's books and records to your stockholders giving them stock or stock options the ability to acquire stock is dangerous if you are willing to do that and you want to be totally transparent it can work I've had to explain this over and over and over again and I've had I have one company that's a government contractor that's growing rapidly right now that we started off doing phantom stock which I'll explain in a second and then one of her advisors on the board of advisors who had sold his company and been very successful said you've got to use stock options it's the only way the employees won't understand anything else and I won't let you do anything else so she said uh, sorry we got to do stock options so we did stock options lo and behold we had a minority shareholder who you know started disrupting the way business was operating wanted to be the the big chief in charge of the business and the owner said and it was a woman she said no I don't want you around anymore you're not doing a good enough job I want you out so we fired we fired him we had to pay to get rid of him because of the shareholders agreement and the stockholders rights that they have and they had rights to examine all the books and records on the other hand if you use synthetic equity which is really phantom stock or stock appreciation rights then you can structure the ability to participate in the upside of a company without giving them any ownership rights or any rights of a stockholder whatsoever the upside for the owner is that you're not giving them any kind of shareholders rights you're not giving them any rights to inspect the books and records you're not even giving them the right to know what the performance of the company is unless the plan specifically identifies what the performance of the company is so in phantom stock the downside is that when you get a payout under a phantom stock plan or stock appreciations right, rights plan it's ordinary income subject to withholding it's treated as a non-qualified deferred compensation plan subject to withholding for FICA and income tax purposes so the downside of phantom stock performance stock stock appreciation rights synthetic equity is it's ordinary income to the employee when they get the payout and that's taxable at rates of up to 43.8 percent versus long-term capital gain if you sell your stock I can get into more nuances back to the ISO example I yep. think that in that situation if the stock plummeted that the, the client could take the loss for AMT purposes when they actually sold the stock is that not true? If yeah I mean if they can claim the loss but you know they still got to pay the tax right? Could they have tax in one year but then if they sold it two or three years later they could uh, if they can pay the tax yeah they can they can, they can cl cl claim a loss to uh, offset any alternative minimum tax income in the future it's a carry forward <laughs> in one case it was a 10 million dollar tax bill all right so we're going to skip ahead the last thing I would say on people is you need an HR consultant you need infrastructure <sighs> one example I had one client that is getting ready to be sold this Friday we're closing on the transaction this Friday and I think I may have mentioned this to you last time but they forgot that they need to get I-9s from every employee that comes to work for them and we've resolved that issue we've gotten through it with the buyer but it, it, it exposes the shareholders to potential liability in the future 
And so having an HR staff or outside outsourced HR consultant involved if you're a startup is absolutely critical. And building the infrastructure from day one, including personnel files, is absolutely critical. Um, how do you manage growth? Six ways identified in a great Forbes magazine article. Um, one, have a medium term goal and stick to it. But have a long term goal, medium term goal, short term goal. Manage to the short term goal, but manage to the long term goal. And always manage against your goals, but chunk it down, as Tony Robbins likes to say. Number two, keep your clients happy. If you don't keep your clients happy, you're not going to have a business to, to stay with. Uh, how do you manage growth? Find a mentor or two. I mentioned last time about advisory boards. I'll mention it again. They're extremely valuable. If you know people or your lawyers or your accountants know people that can help associate you or your clients with people that can help mentor you in the business, extremely important. Networking with those who have been successful, not people who claim to have been successful, but who have been successful is absolutely critical. And building an advisory board is one way of doing it. And of course, building a great team around you, you can't succeed without having people underneath you that will help you launch the rocket ship. And lastly, manage your cash flow closely. A adding by subtraction is achieving economies of scale. As you grow, you, you may cut out certain processes, paperwork and things that you're doing at the early stage, like using Excel spreadsheets to track your profits or customers. You might in implement a CRM that allows you to do it all in one place. That's adding by subtraction. It may cost you a little bit more to implement, but it may cut down on the amount of time and processes that your administrative people have to uh, incur to do that. Um, Everybody wants to be the rocket ship, but set realistic expectations. The hockey stick is this. Revenues are going to do this and not believable, especially at the startup phase and not credible at the startup phase. So having a conservative budget, a conservative cash flow projection, um, setting reasonable goals and then exceeding them makes you feel a lot better than never achieving the goals that they're too lofty to achieve. Adjust your goals periodically, quarterly sit down with your business plan, with your clients should sit down quarterly and, and tack to that plan or adjust the plan <clears throat> and then stay focused. Many, many of my clients start off really well, they have great ideas and then they start having other ideas. If they stayed with the one idea and they stayed focused on the idea, then they'll be successful or if it's not working, try something else. But thanks for participating in episode two of Business Succession Planning and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.